Ah, uh, the Fibonacci sequence. The subject of three Vihart videos, four Mythologer videos, five TED Talks, and 11 number file videos. 16 if you count the ones about the golden ratio. Clearly, these are some very popular numbers. If you've genuinely never heard of them before, I recommend this Vihart series as the best introduction to the subject. But assuming you have, here's a quick refresher. The Fibonacci sequence is defined like this. The zeroth number is zero, the first number is one, and every other number is the sum of the previous two. This last part can be written mathematically using this equation. At any point, the next term is equal to the term you're at right now, this term, plus the previous term. For example, the first number is one, and the zeroth number is zero, and zero plus one equals one, which makes one the second number in this sequence. Then one plus one is two, makes two the third number. One plus two is three, makes three the fourth. Two plus three is five, makes five the fifth, and so on. If you keep going with this process, you end up with this sequence, the Fibonacci sequence. If you look online, you'll find all sorts of fantastical claims about the Fibonacci sequence, some of which are even true. But we're not going to talk about any of those. No, we're going to talk about a Fibonacci mystery so mysterious that you've probably never even heard of it before. That is, unless you've calculated the Fibonacci sequence all the way up to the term 1,548,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
how long would it take for the pattern of digits to repeat? And what if we made that number our base and wrote the Fibonacci sequence again? Would this process keep going forever? This is a lot of stuff to cover, so let's get started. First, I want to make absolutely sure that we're all on the same page on what I mean by a base. And even if you already know how bases work, do pay attention, because I am going to be introducing six new symbols in this section. So the way we write numbers is as follows. We have a symbol for nothing, which is zero, a symbol for one, a symbol for two, a symbol for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. But writing numbers in this way is unsustainable. There are infinitely many numbers, after all. So at this point, instead of making up a new symbol for 10, we simply write 10 like this. We've added a new place value to the left, marking the number of groups of 10. And then we keep this number over here just to tell us that we have no singletons. Then we can continue from here, getting 11, which means 1, 10, and 1, 1, 12, 13, 14, and so on. Adding 1 to the tens place increases the value by 10. So here we have 2 tens and 5 ones. Eventually, we run out of room using two digits, so we add a third digit. Here, the three still means three tens, and the five still means five ones, but now we also have a one in front, meaning one metagroup of ten groups of ten. In this way, we can write any number we like. So, for example, the number of cards in a card deck is five tens and two ones, and the number of elements in the periodic table is one metagroup of ten tens, one ten, and eight ones. The important thing to notice here is that there's nothing special about groups of ten. This system of writing numbers, in which things are grouped in tens, is called decimal numerals. But we could have equally chosen to group things in groups of six. If we had done this, we would have come up with the system that I like to call honeycomb numerals, because branding is everything. Let's see what life would be like using these honeycomb numerals. In a move that might seem crazy right now, I've chosen to use these six new symbols as our digits in honeycomb. Quick side note, the symbols that I'm using here are known as Brazilian tallies. This is a tally system in which the first four tallies make a little box, and then with the fifth tally you draw the diagonal of the box. Otherwise, this works the same as any tally systems that you might have encountered already. Everything that you add gets one tally. Personally, I find this much better than the system I was taught, in which you draw four parallel lines and then the fifth line crosses between them. The individual symbols are easier to read, and also, at the end, you get a pretty little box. So, yeah, it's more aesthetically pleasing and just better. Now, a quick tip for the rest of this video. Let's say you see a symbol, and you don't quite know what it means. You don't remember the value of the symbol. Well, because these are tallies, all you have to do is count one for each line. Just count the number of lines, and that is the value of the symbol. And there you go. Anyways, where were we? Right, honeycomb numerals. So we start as before with the symbol for zero, meaning nothing, and then a one, a two, a three, a four, and a five. But now we've run out of symbols. So to write the next number, we add a place value to the left, writing this as one group of six and no singletons. Then we can keep going, with seven being written like this, as one six and one one. We can add by ones by increasing the number in the last column, and we can add by sixes by increasing the number in the second to last column. When we inevitably run out of room with these two digits, we add a third digit. So this sequence of symbols means that there are 
three groups of six, five singletons, and one metagroup of six groups of six. As before, every single number can be written in this way. So, for example, the number of cards in a playing card deck is one metagroup of six groups of six, two groups of six, and four ones. And the number of elements in the periodic table is three metagroups of six groups of six, one group of six, and four ones. Now that we're all on the same page, we can go back to the Fibonacci sequence. Of course, all that we actually care about right now are the final digits, so let me just gray out the other digits so that we can focus on them. Okay, now is where you want to pay attention, because we are about to make the craziest and most abstract move that we will make in the entire video. Because the only thing that we care about is the final digit, what if we make a new system of numbers? which is decimal numbers, but ignoring everything except the last digit. Would this work? How would it work? Let's try it out. Let's add 5 plus 8, for example. We know that 5 plus 8 is 13, but in this new system, all we care about is the last digit. So we have that 5 plus 8 equals 3. Let's test this some more. 15 plus 8 should give us the same answer as 5 plus 8, because 15 is equal to 5. And indeed, 15 plus 8 is 23, which, if we only look at the last digit, becomes 3. We can try a couple more examples as well. So 365 plus 68 is 433, and 5555 plus 888 is 6,443, all numbers that end in a 3. So it seems like 5 plus 8 equals 3 is a consistent fact within this new system. Let's keep going. What about 5 minus 8? Now, normally we would want to say that 5 minus 8 is equal to negative 3, but negative 3 isn't a digit, so that doesn't really work. Okay, let's just leave this as a question mark for now, and see if our other examples can help us out. 15 minus 8 is equal to 7, no problems there. 365 minus 68 is equal to 297. Huh, that ends in a 7 as well. And... 5,555 minus 888 is 4,667. All of these subtractions give us a 7 in the last digit, so it seems like the system is trying to tell us that 5 minus 8 equals 7. Now, this is weird, but it's not much weirder than 5 plus 8 equals 3. Now, if we do multiplication, it's pretty easy to see that this is going to work out, because any number that ends in a 5 is a multiple of 5, and any number that ends in an 8 is a multiple of 2, so their product has to be a multiple of 10, and therefore has to end with a 0. Still, we again have a consistent fact that 5 times 8 is equal to 0. Okay, one more thing. Let's try division. 5 divided by 8 is 0.625, and, huh, it's kind of hard to tell how we should even interpret that. Okay, well, that's fine. Let's try the other values. Maybe it's like subtraction, and it'll work out. And, um, oh dear. Oh, oh dear. Oh no. Okay, yes. This is definitely not working. Scrap it all. We don't need division anyways. So, in summary, we have that addition, subtraction, and multiplication work in this new system, but not division. Let's call this new system mini decimal, because it's like decimal, but mini. After all, you're not letting any of the values get above 9. Now, we've only really done one example, but this will work in general. To see why, picture an addition in terms of the actual groups that it means. 
So this is 365 plus 68 written out in groups. What we can do is add the groups and the singletons separately. After all, it's just addition, so they're all piling together. But here's the thing. If we're only paying attention to the final digit, we can just label everything on the left-hand side as stuff and not worry about it. And then we can pay attention only to the right-hand side. So we do the addition of 5 plus 8 to get 13. And then we move this group back to the group zone where it belongs. And we are left with our fact that we found before that 5 plus 8 is equal to 3. Now, I'm not going to go through the same logic for subtraction and multiplication, but subtraction is just addition but backwards, and multiplication is just repeated addition, so it kind of makes sense why it would work. And it does work. Using these rules, you can create full addition and multiplication tables for the mini decimal system. Here we see, for example, that 5 plus 8 equals 3, which is what we'd found before. Now, there's a lot of numbers on the screen right now, but I don't really want you to absorb any of them. I just want you to appreciate that there are addition and multiplication tables, which means that this is actually a system of numbers. Okay, now let's get back to the Fibonacci sequence we can use the thing that we've just learned to make this process a lot simpler. Specifically, if we calculate the Fibonacci sequence using only the last digit, the sequence of final digits should stay the same. Let me show you what I mean. Suppose we're calculating the Fibonacci sequence. We've started with 0, 1, and then we have 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, and then we get to 13. But here, we know that 13 is just 3. We can gray out that last digit. Now, so far, this is no better. But here's the trick. Instead of adding 8 to 13, we can just add 8 to 3 and get 11. This should result in the same final digit as before. But then 11 is equal to 1. So instead of adding 13 to 11, we can just add 3 to 1 to get 4, and then 1 to 4 to get 5, and so on. As you can see, even though we're not keeping track of anything beyond the final digit, the sequence of final digits is staying the same. Here we have 3, 1, 4, 5, 9, 4, and so on. Now that we've moved into mini decimal, we're finally ready to solve our first mystery. The key here is to notice that each term in the Fibonacci sequence is entirely determined by the previous two terms, because, you know, it's the sum of them. Now, it's not obvious why this is useful. After all, this was true of the regular Fibonacci numbers as well. But here's the thing. There are only finitely many pairs of terms in mini decimal. Let's see why this is useful. Because the pairs are what's important, let's start thinking about the Fibonacci sequence not as a sequence of numbers, but as a sequence of pairs of numbers. So the first pair is 0, 1, and then the second is 1, 1, and the third is 1, 2, and so on, with each pair pointing to exactly one other pair. Now, I'm going to stop explicitly writing the numbers here, because I just want you to pay attention to the structure. See, what we've got is a sequence of pairs that just moves on forever. The sequence never stops, after all, because the Fibonacci sequence never stops. But the thing is, there are only finitely many pairs, which means that, because the sequence goes on forever, it has to eventually find its way to some place it has already been. It has to cross its own path. And when this happens, well, this pair we already know leads to this pair, and this one goes here, and this one goes here, and this one goes here, and so on, eventually finding its way back here. 
which means this is a loop. And so, the last digits of the Fibonacci numbers have to loop forever. But this doesn't quite solve our mystery. After all, a big part of what made it interesting was that the loop started again with 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and so on. But what if the loop doesn't get back there? What if the sequence finds some other element, like this one, to start the loop? Why is it that the sequence has to eventually end up back where it started? To answer this question, we have to go back to the definition of the Fibonacci sequence. Specifically, this line right here, previous plus this equals next, is the thing that makes it so that each pair points to exactly one other pair. This is because the next term can be calculated from the previous two terms using addition. So the only thing that can possibly come out of this pair is this pair. For example, if we have the pair 8, 3, the only place it can possibly go is 3, 8 plus 3, which is of course 3, 1. But here's the thing. This equation is reversible. Just like we can get the next term from the previous two using addition, we can get the previous term from the next two using subtraction. And that means that there's only one thing that can possibly lead to this pair, which is this pair. So, for example, the only pair which can possibly go into 8, 3 is 3 minus 8, 8 which is, of course, 5, 8. In short, in the same way that this equation means that every pair points to only one other pair, this equation means that every pair is pointed to by only one other pair. And now we can see why something like this is impossible. Because here we have two different arrows pointing into this pair. That's two different pairs which lead there. But this is impossible, which means we could never have made this jump. You can never make a jump to something which has already been jumped to. Therefore, the only place where we can re-enter the path is where it started, because that is the only pair in the path which doesn't have anything already pointing to it. And just like that, we have our loop. We have proved that the pairs of last digits of consecutive Fibonacci numbers have to cycle eventually, which of course implies that the last digits themselves also have to cycle eventually. And just like that, we've solved our first mystery. We now know why the final digits of the Fibonacci sequence repeat. Okay, that was a lot of content with a couple big jumps in there. If you don't understand the argument, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll try to answer any questions that you might have. And if you do understand the argument, pat yourself on the back. You now know the solution to one of our Fibonacci mysteries. Now, as I'm recording, I don't really know how long this video is going to be, but it seems like it's going to be about an hour, which is a long time to be listening to math. So I think it might be helpful to have a little intermission. That's right, it's time for intermission, so feel free to stand up, stretch a little bit, get a drink of water, and if you are an aardvark, make sure to stretch your nose. You can come back as late as you want, or not at all. Either way, I'll be here waiting for you. Alright, I'm going to leave like five seconds of silence for you to pause the video if you want to, and then I'll continue. Right, okay, intermission's over. Now that we've solved our first mystery, we still have a little more work to do. Specifically, we want to know how long it would take for the pattern of digits to repeat if we wrote the Fibonacci sequence in base 60. It's going to take a little bit of wandering before we get there, but stay with me, I promise we'll get there eventually.
First of all, let's look at mini honeycomb. That is, we want a system of numbers, which is the numbers written in honeycomb, but only the last digit matters. Now, I've already explained why the decimal version of this works, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Let's try adding 355 plus 43. If we write these numbers in terms of what they actually mean, we have three metagroups plus five groups of six plus five ones added to four groups of six plus three ones. Just like before, we can separate out all the groups from the singletons. Then, because we only care about the last digit, we can label everything on the left side as stuff and continue only with the right side. Doing this addition, we get one group of six and two ones. And then, if we move this group of six over to the stuff, we get our final answer. Five plus three is equal to two in mini honeycomb. Just like in decimal, using this kind of logic, we can create an entire addition and multiplication table for mini honeycomb. So here we see the fact that we had before, that 5 plus 3 is equal to 2. Again, I don't really want you to absorb any of this. I just want you to know that these tables exist, and so mini honeycomb is a real system of numbers. Now, let's run through this argument very quickly. There are only 6 squared, that is 36, available pairs of mini honeycomb digits. Each pair of Fibonacci numbers uniquely determines both the next pair and the previous pair. Then, if we use the same argument that we did for decimal, we can show that the last digits of Fibonacci numbers must also repeat in honeycomb. And of course, this will work with whatever base we choose. Now, mini decimal and mini honeycomb are examples of what are called rings. Loosely speaking, a ring is a system in which you can add, subtract, and multiply any two numbers. Rings are studied in the mathematical field of abstract algebra, which is really cool. Not only is it really cool, it's also really large, and we have all sorts of concepts and theorems from abstract algebra. In particular, I want to steal one concept from abstract algebra, that is, the product of two rings. This is a way of combining two rings to get a new ring. For example, we can take the product of mini decimal and mini honeycomb, and we should get a new system of numbers. Now, the rules for this new system are as follows. Elements of mini decimal times mini honeycomb are written as pairs of numbers, one from each. So here we have a 7 from mini decimal times a 5 from mini honeycomb. Note that this times symbol here is not actually multiplication. It's basically acting like a comma separating the two of them. Adding two elements in mini decimal times mini honeycomb works independently on each part. For example, 7 times 5 plus 2 times 4 equals 9 times 3. Because 7 plus 2 equals 9 in mini decimal, and 5 plus 4 equals 3 in mini honeycomb. Subtraction and multiplication work the same way, that is, within each component. Now, writing things like this is fun and all, but it would be nice to have a general notation for writing things in bases other than 10 and 6. It turns out this notation already exists. What we've been calling mini decimal is written z divided by 10z, and what we've been calling mini honeycomb is written z divided by 6z. These are pronounced z mod 10z and z mod 6z, respectively. There's also a general notation for the elements of these rings. So, for example, what we've been writing as a box, that is 4 from mini honeycomb, would be written as 4 plus 6z. I'm not going to explain why this notation is the way it is, but I can assure you that there are deep reasons and it does make sense once you understand it. For now, though, we're just going to have to take this at face value. 
Of course, there's nothing special about the numbers 10 and 6. In general, the ring z mod nz is a system in which n is equal to 0. This works for all n greater than or equal to 2. These kinds of rings have been studied a lot, and we have a lot of results about them. In particular, I'm going to steal an important result about rings from abstract algebra. See, the product that we just looked at, z mod 10z times z mod 6z, has 60 elements. However, it is not the same ring as z mod 60z. But it turns out that the only thing that went wrong here is that 10 and 6 are both even. That is, they share a factor of 2. From abstract algebra, we have this theorem. For any whole numbers, p and q, which are greater than or equal to 2 and have no prime factors in common, we have that z mod pqz is equalish to z mod pz times z mod qz. Now, there's one important thing here which should be giving you pause. What the heck does this symbol mean? Well, this symbol comes from abstract algebra and means is isomorphic to. This leads to an obvious question. What does isomorphic mean? Now, the definition of isomorphic is a really classic mathematician definition. Two rings are isomorphic if there exists an isomorphism between them. So now we need to know what is an isomorphism. An isomorphism is a mapping which matches every element of one ring to every element of another. For example, what you see here is an isomorphism between mini honeycomb on the left and z mod 6z on the right. Now, not just any mapping will do. What's important is that this mapping leave the addition and multiplication tables unchanged. Let me show you what I mean with the multiplication tables. Here we have the multiplication table for mini honeycomb on the left and the multiplication table for z mod 6z on the right. What's important to notice here is that the multiplication table on the left matches with the multiplication table on the right through the mapping that we had before. So you can see that all of the ones are in the same places, all of the twos are in the same places, all of the threes are in the same places, all of the fours are in the same places, and all of the fives are in the same places. This is what makes the mapping an isomorphism and not just a map between the elements. Now, while we're here, I want to draw your attention to two special columns. Here, we have an element which equals itself when multiplied by anything. This is called the zero of the ring. And here, we have an element which, when multiplied by any other element, equals that other element. This is called the one of the ring. What's important to notice here is that the zero of mini honeycomb corresponds to the zero of z mod 6z. And the one of mini honeycomb corresponds to the one of z mod 6z. This will happen in general. The zeros and the ones always match up like this. Identifying the zero and the one is going to be important soon. Now we're almost ready to solve our second mystery. First, an easier problem. How long does it take for the Fibonacci digits to repeat in honeycomb? We know that they repeat, we've proven that already, but how big is the cycle? The trick here is going to be to express z mod 6z as a product. Now, 6 is equal to 2 times 3, and 2 and 3 are coprime. Therefore, from the theorem that we had before, z mod 6z is isomorphic to z mod 2z times z mod 3z. Now, let's look at the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence in z mod 6z starts with 0 plus 6z. The question is, what element does 0 plus 6z correspond to in the product? Well, we know what the elements of z mod 2z times z mod 3z look like. They have to look like some element of z mod 2z times some element of z mod 3z. Remember that this times isn't actually a multiplication, it's just coming from the group product. Now then, 
what do these question marks have to be in order to correspond to 0 plus 6z? Well, if we look at 0 plus 6z, we see that it is, in fact, the 0 of z mod 6z. And we know that through an isomorphism, zeros have to match up to zeros. So this mystery element has to be the 0 of z mod 2z times z mod 3z. Because addition and multiplication work independently between the terms, there is only one way to get something that acts like 0 on the right-hand side. That is, we need a 0 in z mod 2z and a 0 in z mod 3z. So 0 plus 6z corresponds to 0 plus 2z times 0 plus 3z. Let's put this fact to the side for now and keep going with the Fibonacci sequence. The next number is 1, and again we ask the question, what element of the product does this correspond to? This time, of course, we have the 1 of the ring, that is, the thing which leaves everything else unchanged when multiplying. Because multiplication works independently within the components, the only way to get an element like that is to have a 1 in z mod 2z and a 1 in z mod 3z. And there we go. The next term in the Fibonacci sequence is another 1, so we already know what the answer is for there. But then we get to 2, and here we might have a problem. After all, we don't have any rules for what the 2 is, or where it must match up. So how are we going to figure out what element this corresponds to? Well, we do have one easy way to figure this out. We know that 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, and we know that the addition tables are the same on either side of the isomorphism. This means that we can find the element corresponding to 2 by adding together the elements corresponding to 1. And of course, addition happens component-wise, so we can do this easily. 1 plus 2z plus 1 plus 2z is equal to 0 plus 2z, because remember, z mod 2z is a system in which 2 is equal to 0. This means that this question mark has to be equal to 0. Looking at the other component, 1 plus 3z plus 1 plus 3z is equal to 2 plus 3z. So this question mark has to be a 2. And just like that, we've found the element corresponding to 2 plus 6z. Now, because the Fibonacci sequence is defined by addition, this strategy is going to keep working forever. So, for example, the next element, which is 3 plus 6z, has to correspond to the sum of these two elements. Here we have a 1, because 1 plus 0 is equal to 1 in z mod 2z. And here we have a 0, because 1 plus 2 is equal to 0 in z mod 3z. Remember that z mod 3z is a system in which 3 is equal to 0. And we can continue like this. The next element corresponds to 0 plus 1, which equals to 1 in z mod 2z, and 2 plus 0, which equals to 2 in z mod 3z. Then we can get the next element, and the next, and so on. In order to make this easier to read, I'm going to rewrite these sequences over here with just the number part. So these numbers are just the numbers in z mod 6z, these numbers are just the numbers in z mod 2z, and these numbers are just the numbers in z mod 3z. But Here's the important thing to notice. These two sequences are just the Fibonacci sequence in z mod 2z and the Fibonacci sequence in z mod 3z, respectively. In particular, we can see that they repeat. So the z mod 2z sequence repeats every three numbers, and the z mod 3z sequence repeats every eight numbers. Now, let's investigate these sequences more closely. We know that the pattern in z mod 6z corresponds exactly to the pattern of pairs in z mod 2z and z mod 3z. What this means is that the pattern in z mod 6z will repeat exactly when both the pattern in z mod 2z and the pattern in z mod 3z repeat. The length of this cycle 
is the least common multiple of 3 and 8, which is written LCM 3 8 and is equal to 24. To see why this is, note that the length of the cycle has to be a multiple of 3 in order for the Z mod 2Z pattern to repeat, and it has to be a multiple of 8 in order for the Z mod 3Z pattern to repeat. And of course, when it is both a multiple of 3 and 8, you'll have that both of the patterns are repeating, which means that the overall pattern of pairs is also repeating. The first time this happens is at the smallest multiple of both 3 and 8 which is 24. Sure enough, if you write down the Fibonacci sequence using honeycomb numerals, the sequence of final digits repeats every 24 numbers. And now, finally, we have blown this case wide open, because there was nothing special about the number 6. All that mattered was that we could split the number 6 into the numbers 2 and 3, which were easier to work with, and then we could put together those solutions to get the solution for the number 6. And now, if we use the same strategy, we can finally solve the problem for base 60. Here we go. 60 is equal to 3 times 20, and 3 and 20 have no prime factors in common. Therefore, z mod 60z is isomorphic to z mod 3z times z mod 20z. 20 is equal to 5 times 4, and 5 and 4 share no prime factors. Therefore, z mod 20z is isomorphic to z mod 5z times z mod 4z. In total, we have that z mod 60z is isomorphic to z mod 3z times z mod 5z times z mod 4z. Let's look at the pattern of Fibonacci digits in each of these. In z mod 3z, we have the pattern of 8, which we saw already when doing base 6. In z mod 5z, we have a pretty long pattern, which repeats every 20 digits. And in z mod 4z, we have a shorter pattern, which repeats every 6 digits. Now, the pattern in z mod 60z will repeat exactly when all three of these patterns repeat simultaneously. And this happens at the least common multiple of 8, 20, and 6, which is 120. Therefore, in base 60, the final digits of the Fibonacci numbers cycle every 120 terms. Let's take a moment to step back and appreciate that we managed to figure this out without converting any numbers into base 60 and without calculating out 120 terms of the Fibonacci sequence. In doing so, we have solved part of our final mystery. But if you remember, we did have one more question. What if we keep going? Let's try the same thing in base 120. Here we go. 120 is equal to 3 times 40, and 3 and 40 have no prime factors in common. Therefore, z mod 120z is isomorphic to z mod 3z times z mod 40z. 40 is equal to 5 times 8, and 5 and 8 have no prime factors in common. Therefore, z mod 40z is isomorphic to z mod 5z times z mod 8z. In total, we have that z mod 120z is isomorphic to z mod 3z times z mod 5z times z mod 8z. And now we find the cycles in each of those smaller rings. We already know that z mod 3z repeats every 8 digits and that z mod 5z repeats every 20 digits. But now, we have z mod 8z instead of z mod 4z, which repeats every 12 digits. Then the cycle in z mod 120z repeats exactly when all three of these cycles are repeating at the same time. This happens at the least common multiple of 8, 20, and 6, which is 120. Therefore, 
In base 120, the Fibonacci final digits cycle every 120 turns. Huzzah! And just like that, we have solved all of the mysteries that we set out to solve. If we wrote out the digits of the Fibonacci sequence in base 60, it would repeat every 120 digits. And if we continue this process, it does not go on forever, because 120 goes right back to 120 and stays in place. Okay, so that's the end of the video. We've done all the math, solved all the mysteries, and now we can go home. I do have a few closing remarks, but imagine that the credits are rolling and the house lights have come on and the doors at the back of the theater have opened. It's, it's okay to leave now. But for those of you who are sticking around, I'll try to make it worth your while. Before anything else, I should probably just explain what's going on on the screen right now. What you're seeing here is a visual representation of the ring Z mod 120Z. This is the very last ring that we talked about, and it's the end point of writing the Fibonacci numbers in base 10, and then finding the length of the cycle, and then making that your base, and finding the length of that cycle, and so on. So, in general, one of the ways that people think about Z mod NZ is as the collection of rotations on a dial with N tick marks, and that's what you see here. Also, to make things more visually interesting, uh, any rotations that are on the left-hand side are counterclockwise instead of clockwise, uh, but, you know, it's effectively the same. Looking at it like this, you can kind of see why I refer to this as a system in which 120 is equal to zero. Because you can see that the number line is, like, almost physically wrapped around itself, so that the number 120 overlaps with the number 0. They're both at the very top there. Now, the specific arrows that you see correspond to the Fibonacci numbers in Z mod 120Z. And, of course, this also corresponds to the final digits of the Fibonacci numbers if you write them in base 120. Each new arrow is the sum of the previous two arrows, with the youngest arrows, the newest arrows, being closest to the outside of the dial. Okay, now that that's done, uh, I'd like to remind you of the Brazilian tallies that I used for digits in Honeycomb. I genuinely think that it's a much prettier tally system than, I mean, than the one I grew up with, and also more effective. Actually, fun fact, in one of the takes for the side note about Brazilian tallies, my assistant actually messed up writing the regular tallies. Like, she momentarily lost count of the number of vertical lines. And, I mean, it's great because, like, what, what you saw in the video was a performative scribble of aesthetic displeasure. But what she actually did that time was a genuine scribble of frustration. It's very good. Um, anyways, yeah. Uh, if you only take one thing away from this video, take away that Brazilian tallies are cool. That's This was a, what is it, 55 minutes now, I think it'll be? This, this was a 56 minute video about how Brazilian tallies are cool, with other things thrown in there in order to keep you distracted. Speaking of which, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my wonderful friend who made the video footage for me. Uh, she's asked that I don't include her name in the video, but, you know, she knows who she is. And I'm sorry that the, the plant thing didn't work out. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Grant Sanderson, the creator of 3 Blue 1 Brown, for making the Summer of Math Exposition program, which this is a part of, or, you know, a submission for. I definitely would not have created the video uh, without that as a sort of incentive for me. Uh, I've wanted to make math videos like this for the longest time, but this is the first time the timing worked out that I could actually do it. Um, oh, check this out. Wait, 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 wait. This is, uh, it's gone to zero now. This happens only twice during the entire cycle. This is, this is the only other zero 
other than the initial one. Uh, and now it's gone. Aww. Uh, anyways, where was I? Grant Sanderson, good program. Program is good. Uh, right, yeah. So what I was going to say was that a lot of things lined up in order for this uh in order for this video to come into being and i don't anticipate things lining up like that again so i'm not i'm fairly confident that at least in the near future there will not be any more uh math exposition videos from me in spite of what I want, uh, because I have so many ideas. But even if this does end up being the only time I ever create a math video, I had a lot of fun making it, and I think it was worthwhile. I think it was good. I'm, I'm really proud of what I've ended up with. Um, oh, also, I forgot to say, uh, this animation was created in Manim, and that's another thing that I definitely would not have attempted if it weren't for the contest being created by 3Blue1Brown. So Manim is a mathematical animation program uh, created by 3Blue1Brown. And it's like real intuitive. I managed to create this animation in literally a single day. Um, kind of a hectic day, but still a single day. And yeah, it does the rotation weird. Those are supposed to be rotations, but it's like squishing them into the center as it rotates the arrows. See, like that one, nice. Um, but yeah, o overall the overall the animation software is is really really intuitive, and it just does what you tell it to do, which is like. That's what you want from from an animation software, from a mathematical animation software. Um, yeah, that's that's it for me. We're only we're only at oh step one hundred. Uh, yeah, so we started at step one, and that number in the upper left corner has been counting up by one each cycle. So uh, when that reaches one hundred and twenty one, we should be at. Zero, 01 again uh, but i'll just leave that for you to discover i mean the total animation goes to 150 151 i think uh whatever it is to make it exactly 10 minutes long so yeah i'm not gonna sit here talking for all of that time uh actually i've talked long enough that we can see this is the end See, the, the whole... It's so cool watching the arrows just kind of destroy each other in pairs. Like, this red one brings it closer to zero, and then this green one brings it closer to zero. Uh, and then you're gonna see... Aw, oh, it's happening. It's happening. Two plus 119 is one. 1 plus 119 is 0. 1 plus 0 is 1! We did it. We've come back. And now it's, of course, going to go 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and so on. Uh, yeah, so there's two minutes left of this animation. I'm just going to let it play out without me talking the whole time. But uh, thank you for watching my video. It was... A labor of love um, and I had a lot of fun making it so yeah I I hope the rest of your day goes well and the rest of your life goes even better
just a little rubber chicken noise for, for all the rubber chicken fans out there.